Good evening from our headquarters in Kyiv. This is this Sunday show on Romatsk International, the only prime time TV program explaining the Eastern European geopolitical storm in English. And I'm Natalia Humanyuk. And that's what we have for you tonight. Armenian Prime Minister and government resign, the protests continue. Russia tries to ban Telegram messaging application, fails. Renowned political philosopher Francis Fukuyama on Ukraine. 32 years since the Chernobyl nuclear explosion, we revisit the region. After nearly two weeks of widespread anti-government protest, Armenia celebrated the much-anticipated resignation of President-turned-Prime Minister Ser Sarksyan on April 23rd. The people celebrated, yet didn't go home. Fresh rounds of civil demonstration were also emerging across the whole country as talks between the incumbent Republican Party and the opposition broke down. Opposition leader Nikol Pashinyan, who led the protest against Sarksyan, called on Armenian to continue the protest until the leadership switched hands. On the May 1st, the National Assembly of Armenia may vote for the new prime minister, who is expected to call for a snap elections. According to the constitution, they might take place within two months. We are talking to the director of the Yerevan-based Analytical Center of Globalization and Regional Cooperation, Stepan Grigorian, about what's next for the country. Stepan, at the time of our previous program last Sunday, you were shortly detained with a number of other protesters. And earlier, before that, you were one of the very few people who uh, predicted the change of uh, power in Armenia. So we're happy to hear you safe and sound, and we are following up what's going on in Armenia and would like to hear. So what exactly happening in the street of Yerevan, in other towns? What are people doing? Uh, no, in Armenia, uh, situation uh, uh, is very tension. Uh, big meetings, uh, big uh, uh, um, uh, spread it on holes of Armenia. Um, pickets. Uh, our uh, protesters uh, blocks the streets uh, and uh, main roads in in Armenia. Yesterday was a very big meeting in city Vanadzor, who is third city in Yerevan, uh, in Armenia. What I want to say, very tension, tension situation. Uh, the, this movement is not only the movement of opposition, this is the uh, national movement. It's very interesting. Um, uh, this is a real, the uh, Vilvet revolution, not color, but revolution, velvet revolution, and uh, very quickly developed situation. Uh, you know, we uh, waiting the voting process in parliament in May, May 1st, and we hope that four fractions in parliaments include Republican Party, ruling party, will vote uh, leaders or leader of opposition, Nikol Pashinyan. We hope will be so. But before that, people will press our government, will continue these meetings and protest actions. Can you say with what, uh, you know, political ideas uh, Nikola Pashinyan, if elected, would uh, lead the country? What would be his actions? Because it's indeed more or less uh, the, um, I should say, the compromise figure, because he's very much the face of the protest, but we know those protests were not just the face of a one man or one party of one opposition. So what we can expect uh, in that from the political movements he will have and also uh, what would happen to the parliament and to the government because what we also know that uh, most of the majority in the parliament belong to the previous uh, ruling party, uh, it's the uh, Republican Party, and the people on the street were not exactly who were very much represented in the political life uh, of Armenia. Uh, yes, we have a uh, so strange situation when uh, the leader of nation is a representative of opposition, but uh, old old authorities, uh, authority has majority in parliament. Uh, the situation is uh, so that 
Parliament don't reflect adequate the moods in the society. Um, and it will be need uh, to resolve this uh, through election to uh, uh, Nikol Pashinyan. Uh, so crisis uh, political when Parliament a majority in Parliament, Republican Party has a majority in Parliament, uh, don't adequate reflect the reality. Uh, what uh, wants opposition or Nikol Pashinyan? Uh, he wants to elect a prime minister. After that, after that, uh, uh, after that, organize, organize, snap, uh, election of, uh, elections of our parliament. You know, we live now uh, in parliamentary system. We transfer from presidential to parliamentary system. What it means? The parliament is the main institute in the country. Why? If we have political crisis, it will be needed to organize a new, new electoral process. But what is important? It is important to have this opposition leader on the prime minister's position. Only in these cases, our society will believe, uh, believe that we will have a chance to organize normal elections. Our last elections uh, was one year ago one year ago with falsifications, with uh, 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 using of administrative resources, bribers process was, uh, why, why is this used uh, Republican Party, uh, who has today formal majority, Ser Sarkisian resignated. It means we have positive situation, but it's not enough. It will be need to uh, elect uh, Nikol Pashinyan as a prime minister, and after that, organize uh, new new elections uh, on uh, in in our national assembly. So, is Nikol Pashinyan a temporary candidate for the prime minister? Somebody very reputable to have this uh, temporary position before the there are the results of the parliamentary elections. And uh, if so, um, and in any case, what are his political views? Uh, what forces he represents? You know, is he more conservative? Is he, you know, do he have any ideas on the uh, cooperation of Armenia with European Union? Do we, do, does he, what, what kind of political views he have? And uh, also, if, if he is, though, who are other people who later, after the uh, election, could run Armenia? What political forces could be there if uh, there are fair elections at the moment? Yes, this is a key issue. A key issue. Uh, it will be need to elect new parliament to have in parliament real political forces. After that, we will say you uh, what the views dominate in our parliament. Today's parliament is not political parliament. Republican Party has 60 percent percent mandates. Uh, from this 60 percent mandates, uh, only five or six. Uh, Republican Party's members in Parliament are politicians, and others, some, some of them are oligarchs, some of them uh, co uh, corruption persons. We have so type uh, negative situation. Why it will be need to have political? Uh, but Nikol Pashinyan opened, opened yesterday, or after to yesterday in Gyumri meeting, opened some his views connecting with uh, uh, international. Uh, cooperation issues. He said we will cooperate with Russia, we continue to cooperate with Russia, we will work in CSTO organization, this is security system in the framework of C, uh, CIS at uh, post-Soviet territory, and he said we are ready to adopt, adopt SEPA this uh, agreement with European Union. This is a normal view, but he don't deeply open this. The main issue for him and for his party, he has not big party, but very dynamic, very good party. Interesting. Uh, the main issue is fighting against corruption. This is the main uh, problem in Armenia, fighting against uh, oligarchic system in economic area. And he arises these issues, this uh, uh, represents this program uh, in his uh, meetings. But first of all, it will be needed to send uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, to uh, 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 weigh out 
uh, the peoples uh, who are uh, who are uh, oligarchs. Uh, it will be need to isolate them from political area, uh, co corruption persons, um, non-popular persons. It will be need to do so that clean the system from social persons. Uh, Nikol Pashinyan said many times about uh, orientations. In Armenia, he said this revolution is not uh, with geopolitical vector. It's not connecting with uh, geopolitical issues. Uh, he said that uh, this is um, uh, uh, n this is not a revolution against Russia, against Europe, against United States, against Iran, against Georgia. Uh, this is uh, this is a revolution to construct normal democratic countries. Uh, what will be after? After difficult to say, maybe some accents uh, he will um, uh, uh, present us. But today, um, uh, today, as I, I think, uh, he has multi. Uh, he will use so type multi vector policy, uh, foreign policy. Um, uh, I, I think I think so will be so. But uh, he is well known for politics, and I don't remember that he uh, uh, had so type uh, concrete orientation. I uh, don't remember that he maybe two years ago said it will be need to be your EU. No, I, I, I said not about this. He, he is classical domestic uh, well-known politician. The Armenian stays on the streets also to commemorate the 1.5 million Armenians who died at the hands of the Ottoman Empire in 1915. Our correspondent Ostap Yarish spent a day with some locals as they remembered the victims of genocide and looked towards the future of their country. Let's take a look. Recently, two days ago, it was my birthday. I told everyone not to get me any presents. My only gift will be Sarkisyan's dismissal. I can't even say it when you ask. No, really? No, really. Where did you hear that? They sent me a text message, I say. Let me see for myself. First reaction is disbelief. We just couldn't believe it because it's impossible that he would resign like that. But life shows that nothing is impossible. Forty people gathered in total. We sat there, in the street, and over there, everywhere. I probably didn't know 80% of the people who gathered there. If you search my house now, you won't find anything to drink. Yes, Natulik. Are you going? Today the destination is Tsitsinakabur, of course. The monument is a memorial for the victims of the genocide. Just the four of us. Everyone remembers on this day, but today the mood is probably a bit more upbeat. You can't call this joy, but there is a joy all the same. You could say that we won yesterday. <laughs> All the same, yes, it is a day of remembrance, but somehow people are not. It's all about yesterday. A lot of people were killed, and this is mainly the colour of the people, because politicians, poets, writers, scientists were killed first. 
but yesterday was when the survivors confirmed their right to live. We can't be broken, we can't be destroyed. We have our own country and already victorious country. This means something. There is not a single family in Armenia unaffected by this tragedy. All of us, myself included, are descendants of those Armenians. My grandmother was born in 1915, and they told us how she was transported in a basket. After all, taking small children out of Turkey was prohibited before. A lot of children stayed there. They say that as a newborn she was put in a basket, and my great-grandmother held the basket overboard. If the child suddenly started crying, she would have let go because she has other older children. They had to go, but my grandmother was clever. She didn't cry. And so they went to Abhazia to begin with, and then from Abhazia to Yerevan. We actually walked for three hours. There's a lot of people here this time. We'll now go down to the eternal flame where we will lay down flowers. The amount of people here shows that they want to destroy us. We're alive, alive. There will be even more of us. We're alive. The full versions of our reports and interviews could be found on our web page. Also sign up for our brand newsletter if you would like to receive Hromatsk International weekly highlights. The sign up box is on the upper right hand side of the web page. And follow us on Twitter and Facebook, search Hromatsk International. We are there 24 7 for you. And I'll be back in a second. Can Facebook and Twitter be banned in Russia? Would it pose political risks to the Kremlin? Reports about government crackdown on independent media and websites come thick and fast from Russia, so perhaps it seemed like nothing but old news when people started hearing about the attempts to block Telegram, one of the few encrypted messaging applications in Russia. Earlier, its creator Pavel Durov refused to provide the government with access to users' conversations. But in its attempts to ban Telegram, Russia has managed to block pretty much everything but Telegram so far. We speak with Andrei Soldatov, a Russian investigative reporter and security service expert, as well a co-author of the book The Red Web, The Struggle Between Russia's Digital Dictators and the New Online Revolutionaries, on how this fight between the state and tech company may affect Russian society. For many years, uh, the Russian Internet Censorship Agency, Roskomnadzor, ha has been trying to find a way to uh, put global platforms and messengers uh, under control of the Kremlin. And the problem was that there was no political decision uh, from the Kremlin to, to go and uh, ban one of uh, the big global platforms. And finally, uh, it looks like Roskomnadzor got this uh, political decision from the Kremlin, so they got this license uh, to start a major offensive on Telegram, no matter what. And uh, they actually they started a large offensive, and uh, now uh, they started attacking not only the Telegram, but because Telegram uh, got other big platforms involved. Uh, like Amazon or Google because they uh, move their AP addresses to these platforms. The problem is that uh, once Roskomnadzor got this uh, license to attack, they do not think of the political cost. And potentially it's a very dangerous situation, not only because of Telegram. Uh, if you can survive, well, another week like that or another month like that, I mean, Roskomnadzor, given all political hate they, uh, they are getting from, say, from all political criticism they, they are getting, well, they can move on and start blocking something bigger, like Facebook or Twitter. 
But really, what we understand that uh, Roskomnadzor and the Russian state is failing to really do what they want. And it looks like uh, using a hammer uh, and, uh, and destroying some other services. So why they are failing and why it happens that totally different, uh, unexpected uh, you know, services aren't, are, aren't working? Yes, this is a bright side of this. Uh, so we see that uh, Telegram is still uh, operational, still accessible for most of the Russian uh, readers. Uh, but unfortunately, there is also a downside. Uh, first of all, as far as we know, uh, uh, well, uh, the audience of uh, Telegram channels uh, actually uh, didn't make it uh, to, uh, largely didn't make it to the service. Uh, 73%, 76% uh, actually decided and just lost. Uh, they didn't have access to channels and they do not care. Uh, so we have these big losses in audiences of uh, Telegram channels. The other thing is uh, that uh, what is Roskomnadzor doing? They actually they changing the political climate in the country, especially for for the IT business. And if say IT business uh, would um, accept this new reality, it would make other things much more uh, well easier for Roskomnadzor to do. For instance, to uh, to introduce some new form of censorship and filtering, or to attack some other platforms. And maybe you will get us into more, a, bit, a bit technical side of it because, and the way technically how capable are uh, security services and all those uh, government bodies uh, because we always, you know, this is something new for a lot of people. You need to have some knowledge, some uh, techniques, you know, uh, you, you have to have, and sometimes these uh, digital companies are just smarter. Um, so in this regard, uh, what it shows about the, the knowledge and the technical abilities of the security uh, bodies for uh, at this particular battle? Well, they, uh, they proved to be not very sophisticated. They made a lot of mistakes uh, just uh, a day ago. They blocked accidentally Yandex and uh, Vkontakte. And uh, so they, they are making a lot of mistakes. Uh, uh, the problem is that the audience um, is um, not that sophisticated, uh, sophisticated too. So we have the problems with um, so people are many people are not still are not ready to install VPN, uh, and we expected more people to be able to install VPN and to use proxy uh, to access Telegram. So we have this core audience of Telegram who are, are on Telegram mostly for political reasons, and these people they still have access and they care uh, to uh, have access to Telegram. But the rest, um, say people in small businesses uh, who launched their Telegram channels because they promoted some food or uh, some e-commerce, uh, they they just live in, and um, which which means that. Uh, things like proxy and VPN is still for a very small audience in Russia. And how does the general public react? Uh, I know that there is a, a lot of, you know, articles, uh, the, the media are writing a lot about all these, you know, more curious cases when things are not working and it doesn't look that it's some, somehow supported by, by the public, but, but really what is the political consequence for that? Uh, it's, uh, it's a very interesting uh, moment uh, because we have some uh, institutions uh, affected by this uh, censorship and they are very far from, say, political things. Uh, we have some banks, uh, huge banks, we have some services like Aeroflot, uh, and people actually complain that they have problems accessing uh, these services, uh, which means that more people actually now know what's going on on the Russian internet, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, but at the same time, we have small businesses uh, attacking Telegram because they believe that um, the strategy of Pavel Durov uh, to get global platforms involved uh, actually, um, well, they, small businesses now, should pay for that. So we have a divided community of users in a way. 
And finally, just really um, let us understand why Telegram and in particular, uh, who is Pavel Durov? Uh, what is, uh, you know, can you explain his character, the uh, founder and the owner of Telegram? Well, Telegram is, uh, is attacked not only because it provides uh, services of a messenger, because we have plenty of messengers and many of them very popular, much more popular uh, than, say, Telegram for instance, uh, WhatsApp or Messenger on Facebook. But Telegram is quite unique because it provides the option of uh, channels. And in a country where you have restricted freedom of the media, and you cannot talk openly about sensitive things because you might get prosecuted and attacked by the authorities, channels on Telegram give you uh, this opportunity. You can share gossip, you can share real information. It's, uh, in a way, it's uh, like we had in the Soviet Union in the 80s. Uh, you have a tool to share and to trade gossip. Uh, but it's a very important thing because lots of people are now, they rely heavily on Telegram channels uh, <clears throat> in getting the information about what's going on in the country. That's why Telegram uh, came out under attack. And also it's personal. Uh, Pavel Durov, uh, while he had a history of dealing with, uh, with the Russian authorities, uh, before that he was a founder of uh, VK, of Kontakte, and he was um, not very cooperative with the Russian security services. Uh, when we had protests in Moscow, he refused to take down some of the protest group. Uh, when you got Maidan, he refused to I uh, give up data of uh, Maidan activists uh, to, uh, to the Russian security services. And for that, he was expelled from his company. And actually, that prompted him to launch Telegram. But he is a very ambiguous figure. Uh, in a way, he's, um, he's a bit more controversial. Uh, he's not only uh, a guy who he wants us to think that he just fights for freedom, but unfortunately, uh, he decided to use this, uh, uh, this situation that he is uh, in now to uh, get some, say, uh, some advantages over his competitors. Uh, for instance, just a week ago, he published a post and said that the Russian authorities are very stupid because they attack a service which is uh, neutral uh, to the Russian authorities and forcing uh, his users, Telegram's users, to move to uh, another platform uh, which is under control of the U.S. government. Uh, and he specifically mentioned that WhatsApp. And of course, this kind of language, when you think that there are some platforms under control of the U.S. government, or I don't know what kind of government, uh, is, uh, is a very Kremlin language. It's, um, unfortunately, it's, it's a not a, good, a very good thing. But still, the case of uh, Telegram is bigger than the case of uh, this particular company, uh, Pavel Durov. Everybody, I mean, the community of uh, activists in Moscow, they understand what is at stake. And what is at stake is access to, uh, to global platforms like Google, Twitter, Facebook. It's not only about Telegram. In the world of international politics and reforms, Francis Fukuyama is a force to be reckoned with. Currently a senior fellow at Stanford Freeman Spongli Institute, he is best known for his belief that the triumph of liberal democracy at the end of the Cold War marked the last ideological stage in the progression of the human history. A few days ago, we were honored to have him in our studio. He shared his views on Ukraine, Russia and political ideology. It's, uh, there, it's not a coincidence that Fukuyama is in Kyiv, as also, you should know that he is working with some of the Ukrainian emerging leaders and uh, talking to a number of the young politicians in Ukraine. So, uh, Francis, um, we're speaking about the uh, building of democracy, mm -hmm. and uh, yet uh, there is a concept that today mm -hmm. a lot of governments, a lot of people who come to power, uh, they have... They, they proclaim that they have democratic views, mm -hmm. they respect elections, mm -hmm. they have parties, but in the end, it's more or less a facade of democracy. Mm -hmm. In the end, everybody already, already know how to rig the elections, mm -hmm. how to not let the opponents to the media, mm -hmm. uh, and in the end, have just the party who doesn't really consult uh, the population, uh, and 
this this idea of the freedom, freedom of speech, and all the reforms are often kind of considered as something annoying, enforced by the West, which we have to do to cooperate with the Western allies. Mm -hmm. To what extent do you see these concerns, and to what extent it's applicable to Ukraine? And what could be done with that? So that's a definite problem. There's a rise of populism, uh, populist nationalists in many parts of Eastern Europe. And you know you see signs of this in Western Europe and even in the United States right now. Uh, a democracy is a really complex thing, a liberal democracy, because it needs a, a clean, impartial state uh, to deliver services and protect the population. It needs a rule of law, which limits the power of the state State, and it needs democratic elections accountability to make sure the state responds to the interests of the whole people. And what's happening is these populists are using their democratic legitimacy to undermine the other two parts. So they corrupt the state. You know, they make the state their own piggy bank. You know, for their own business interests, they uh, get in bed with businessmen, oligarchs that you know want to use state power to protect their businesses and vice versa. Uh, and they really hate the rule of law because the rule of law prevents them from doing what they want. It shields them from accountability. And so this is the pattern you're seeing in Hungary and Poland and Turkey uh, and I think even in some respects in the United States uh, where these populist leaders are using their popular mandate to weaken the other uh, institutions of liberal democracy. Uh, but if we also um, speak about um, Ukraine, mm -hmm. let's say, <clears throat> Uh, so um in 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 that in in that, uh, in, in, in that regard um uh to s to, I'm asking about this kind of play with the West, mm -hmm. when the people say that, okay, uh, we will follow the reforms, we will do that, but mm -hmm. in fact, the state building is more important, especially when we're living in the turbulent times, mm -hmm. for instance, in case of Ukraine, we definitely have a Russian aggression, mm -hmm. so uh, we can make some compromises. Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe temporary, mm -hmm. but unless we have a war, we have we can do compromises on freedoms, on some other things, and that will be sorted out later. Mm -hmm. What you would say to that extent? How these kind of ideas of freedom and the state building mm -hmm. in a very a volatile environment mm -hmm. works together? Well, you know, the state building has good aspects and bad aspects. Its bad aspects is when the government uses war as an excuse to clamp down on criticism, on journalists, on opposition groups that may you know, object to things that it's doing. Uh, on the other hand, you know, wars are very serious in terms of creating national identity and a certain sense of unity. So uh, in Ukraine, I, I see both of those things going on. Uh, I do see the war you know, being used uh, to some extent by the government as an excuse for not addressing certain kinds of reforms that are, are necessary, because really the state needs to be not just strong in a repressive sense, it needs to be strong in the sense of being you know, a clean institution that can actually respond to public interests rather than the private interests of you know, oligarchs or well-connected people. Ukraine, after the revolution, we had a lot of advisors coming, for instance, from Eastern Europe who looking to the example of the reforms of the 19s in Poland, in Czech Republic, in mm -hmm. Slovakia. Uh, yet, that was right after the communist time. There was not the uh, reforms in the oligarchic mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. uh, which you know sometimes require privatization and other things. In Ukraine, everything already is owned mm -hmm. uh, by somebody. Mm -hmm. And you know, how do you see the difference? How do you see to what extent that kind of just, just usual things shouldn't be copy-pasted? Well, I think that's right, that the way that privatization was done in the 1990s allowed oligarchs to basically capture very large parts of the economy, and they still are dominant in Ukraine. Uh, that didn't happen in the Czech Republic and Poland and Hungary, uh, although now in Hungary you're kind of getting the emergence of new oligarchs because of you know Orban's policy. But in Ukraine, uh, it's a legacy. I think the only way that you can deal with it is by introducing more competition. You know, there needs to be more small and medium-sized businesses growing up that are not part of this oligarchic system. There need to be more multinationals uh, investing in Ukraine. Uh, that's the only way I think you chip away at that domination of the economy by, by this oligarchic structure. And we do have a president who is one of the richest men in the country, which 
actually he has his business and he runs so uh, and it doesn't look like there is any choice that he would give uh, away his uh, what he owns or he would run so still it's so interconnected mm -hmm. and like is it the rule that the people with that amount of money just don't go to politics well it's going to be hard to impose that kind of rule yeah. you know retroactively so I think it, it's a norm that really has to evolve over time I mean you need to elect a different you know type of politician I think down the road, um, so that that you know that distinction is uh, is observed. As I'm saying, unfortunately, this seems to be a trend in a lot of countries where people with money use their money to get political power, and people with political power use it to protect their money. Uh, and that uh, you know is something in law that that needs to be addressed because that's that's not a good development. You know, I think you for for many years you are answering on what was meant by the term the end of history, and you're doing that I think for numerous interviews for many many years. Uh, but if we speak about in, uh, in the end. Uh, the ideas of liberal democracy, which have probably moral superiority mm -hmm. globally still, do you really still think it's there? And uh, to what extent you think that this uh, Russian idea of postmodernism, mm -hmm. of this nihilism, where uh, the you know, that people become, started to believe that it's, it's indeed these democratic ideas, it's, it's a bit of a hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. Because uh, Everybody's corrupt, even the democratic governments are corrupt. Uh, so it, it comes to the place. So, so to what extent do you think this nihilism is really uh, thriving? You know, I don't think that you can build a society around nihilism, like you say. Uh, I think that if the Russian government tries to project this idea that everything is corrupt, it's going to come back to haunt them because people are going to stop believing in you know, their own institutions. So I really don't think that you can build a successful society around these very cynical uh, ideas that simply want to weaken everybody else. Uh, eventually, that's going to come back uh, to haunt you. There is no Russian idea right now. I mean, what does Russia represent other than you know, the opportunity for tremendous political corruption? It's not like communism. You know, communism, for all of its evils, was actually an ideal of a kind of society that was attractive to people in other places. And I just don't see that in the Russian idea right now. Uh, but it's attractive in other places. The well, no, no. The idea of nihilism is not attractive. What, what the Russians are doing is exacerbating existing polarizations and divisions and uncertainties within other countries. That's different from projecting an actual idea. That's simply, you know, trying to widen gaps that already exist. But that's not an idea around which you can build a successful society. So if you would single out some couple of maybe, you know, the priority at this stage while talking to different people, while looking at Ukraine mm -hmm. in terms of the change which is necessary? Well, I think most people would put judicial reform at the top of the list. You know, there really needs to be strong structures that are very independent of the political forces in the country that can really hold officials accountable. Uh, I think, you know, in, in the economy there really needs to be a land reform uh, because there's a lot of hidden assets that are locked up and unavailable, you know, that uh, could spark a lot of growth in this country. Uh, I think those would be two things things that would be at the top of my list. Well, I think Ukraine is very symbolically important to the entire region because it's a country that's trying to break away from its Soviet and Russian past. It wants to orient itself towards Europe. It has a right to do that. Uh, I think that uh, Putin understands that this is what's at stake, and that's why he wants to stop it from happening. So I think that Ukraine has a significance that goes way beyond Ukraine. And if it succeeds, uh, other countries will be take heart from that. And if it fails, uh, they're going to get discouraged. So I think that's, that's why Ukraine is a very important country right now. life after Chernobyl some 10 years ago, many would be tempted to say no. But today it looks like the nuclear disaster torn region has thriving wildlife and returning population. We have with us Oleh Bondarenko, a member of National Commission for Radiation Protection of Ukraine and former director of Chernobyl Radio Ecological Center. Uh, but before we go into discussion, let's take a look at our video report from the town of Chernobyl, where our team spoke with an employee of the Chernobyl Nuclear Power Plant 
plant, as well as with a 80-year-old man who, for 18 years ago, decided to return to his abandoned home in Chernobyl. Четвертый реактор Чернобыльской атомной. Авария на Чернобыльской атомной электростанции. A floor stand RZB for controlling battery radiation. We have hands here on this side, hands on the inside, chest, torso, knees, head. This is my outdoor shower. I returned in 2000. I was born in the city of Slavutich, and I have actually worked here since 2013. I've changed positions a few times. By education, I'm an international relations and politics specialist. I now work in the International Cooperation Department. We have to change down to our underwear. We dress completely in white, socks, trousers, and a shirt like this, and a set with more trousers and a jacket, and also white boot covers. We know what to be afraid of what the risks are, and everyone sets their own limits when it comes to these risks. I have a dog named Chestnut. I like this color for some reason. He's such a nice dog. Calm down, Chestnut. You can't do that. My daughter lives in Vishneva, on the ninth floor. She found some guy who now moved in with her. My son is in his fourth year at the Polytechnical Institute. And Mihailo Pavlovich is here alone in Chernobyl. He's not going anywhere. There are no women for me here, and my children don't have a place for me. Chestnut! Shush. The Chernobyl nuclear power plant is currently in the stage of being decommissioned. We have a 65-year national-wide decommissioning program. We started in 2000, so we still have many years to remove these three electrical power units. As you can see, Bashu 3, the control panel of the third block. This is exactly the same one as in the fourth block. So these are blocks from the same line, which were made by the same construction company. My wife worked at an orphanage. They took kids from the orphanage in Veladarka, past Bilaterkva, another 50 kilometers from there to the west. It so happened that my younger daughter took out a loan to get a two-bedroom flat, so I sold this house and gave her a loan, and then I went to my own house in Chernobyl. Thanks to the administration, they let me in without any problems. I live in my own house. <laughs> Look, it says, I don't drink and I don't smoke over there. I used to smoke when I was younger, but I gave it up. This is our integrated automated control system for the covering, and you can see what we were talking about, the third subzone. Therefore, stuff can be easily here with our respirators. Because we are dressed in the lightweight version of our protective clothing, we can only go there. If, for example, we went through the door of the central hall of the reactor, it would be signposted that this is the first subzone and that you can't go in there. Good. Let's go and look at something interesting. My wife bought us this from Popiat. She was there somewhere and she brought us a sign. Shock work for the homeland, to cover a barrel of cucumbers. Let them decommunize this place. It's no big deal for me. It's my history. I can't escape from it. We milled grain. Three classes worked in my command. 
the first, second and third. I had so much communication that I can't complain. This is a German tin, and this is ours. Look, why do I have them? I found them. They're memories. Now you've seen them too. Damn it, I forgot. If I remember that I didn't tidy up, I, I would have... Here, I have a deck chair, and those are stones from Zakarpatia that someone bought me. What is NSC, New Safe Confinement, or ARCH? What is covering object? It's a protective structure or the fourth reactor unit. What is the sarcophagus? The sarcophagus is nothing. It was invented in 90s by the press and for some reason they called the covering a sarcophagus. We don't have a single document stating what that is at the Chernobyl power plant. <laughs> Come over here and film this, please. I'll tell you about it. These are my mother's icons. This icon was given to me when I was in Pachayev. This one my daughter Oksana brought from Israel. It's also an icon. I'm not aging because I returned to my own land, where I was born. Look, yesterday I planted five rows of potatoes. My daughter was here. She helped me a little bit. She's grown up now. She's nice and everything's good. People ask to go home, like the elderly people. They would happily give away their flats to their children to come here and look after these areas. Millions of people, millions would flee from Crimea, from Donetsk, from Luhansk. If the country's leaders, the leadership of the zone, were interested in this, they would come and have a look around too. Over there where it's fenced off, a neighbour lives there. The whole street is inhabited. When you go there, you'll see. If we talk about the power station stuff, then 90% of the workers live in Slavutich. The other 10, approximately, live in other parts of Ukraine or in Chernihiv. Look, you actually asked how safe it is here. If we say that 100 microsieverts is the dose you're allowed to receive, this is what you receive just outside the arch. What we mean by gamma activity is 10 microsieverts per hour. So you can stand there for 10 hours and you would reach the permitted dose of radiation. This is next to the new safe confinement arch. The arch Arch completely covers the covering. Reactor 4 is under the covering. I will tell you that people fear that which they do not know. There is the same risk with things that people do know about. When you are sat behind the wheel of a car, there is a risk of an accident. When you are sat on a plane, there is certainly a risk of an accident. I think it's like what happens with a lot of professional soldiers. You think that they are under the tremendous amount of stress, but they have their own point of view on something, which is definitely very difficult for us to understand. It's definitely something like this for professionals that work in the nuclear sector. So, how did you like my suite? Let's go. So, Oleg, we just looked at the report uh, from the town of Chernobyl. But for our international audience, what would you uh, tell about the level of the uh, pollution, of how we can assess the general situation in the Chernobyl zone? You know that there are four, th yes. four zone, zones. The first one is mm, ex uh, actually exclusion zone. Uh, the uh, second one zone, at the moment, there is no any city in this zone, so the situation is much better. Third zone is about 30 uh, cities. And uh, according to this uh, um, uh, passportization, about uh, 2,000 cities is out even of fourth zone. So if we compare with the, uh, at the beginning, the situation is much better. Uh, most uh, contaminated areas are located at the north of Kiev, Zhitomer, uh, Rivne and uh, Volyn regions. That's it, in general. So what impact it has today on the population and what still should be done by the authorities, by the government? If we now speaking about the, let's say, health of the people, we'll go for later. A lot of things uh, were done. For this moment, the expenditures of uh, former Soviet Union and then of Ukrainian budgets uh, were huge. 
Uh, we can talk about effectiveness of these uh, spendings, but it is another issue. Uh, what, what is left at the moment? Uh, first of all, people uh, still living in the uh, cities under uh, monitoring of uh, third and fourth zone should be um, provided all necessary conditions for their normal living. And this population is not very huge. It is uh, uh, several dozen thousands people. Uh, another issue is um, human health, because according to uh, general figures uh, published uh, from the beginning, about five million of uh, former Soviet Union people were irradiated after a Chernobyl accident. So it is huge population. And what should be done at the moment, it is uh, insurance system providing uh, them, these people, in case they suffer from uh, certain uh, diseases uh, after Chernobyl, first of all, cancer. Still, we don't have proof for very uh, certain effects after uh, Chernobyl radiation, except particular um, strata of people, for example, liquidators. For them, it is for sure uh, uh, research that uh, they um, observed additional 5% of cancer on the natural level, but it is for liquidators. These people obtained much higher average doses than population. I should say that our next report, which I suggest we watch, is exactly about the about that, exactly about the access to the uh, health care, in particularly in the war-torn region. Даже в этой жизни не знал, что это такое. Даже ему приход на ДП-16 постоянно. 20-25 мл РНГ поставили 56, 8-часовую смену, представьте. А нужно... В самой зоне он был? Ну вот так произошло. Сперва на стройке был поселок, строили в 86-м году. Недалеко там Грушево есть поселок такой, на Днепре. Строили поселок с Шребра, а потом... Уже в 87-м в Чернобыле. 56 выездов на БК-2, вот это на рекорд пошел, делать нечего. Ну, ну трехкратном, платежка в трехкратном. Ну, пенсию неплохую дают. Сколько это вообще? 6700. 6700. Ну, это неплохо по четвертому времени. Угу. Очень хорошо. В общем, по зоне едешь, вот там город есть такой, Чернобыль, Припять. Пустой город, никого, оставлены квартиры, уехали. Это уже 30 лет прошло, елки все. Привели на собеседование туда-сюда. Завтра сразу бросали, не бейся, а я говорю, а что, все, все ходят, и мы, ну, поехали. Респиратор и вперед. В общем, научили, ничего страшного. Ну, а самое сделали до нас саркофаг, этот закрыли, ребята, что же, солдаты такие. Давление у меня повышенное вообще с детства. 150 на 100 было, постоянно где-то такое давление. У него перед тем, помнишь, перед инсультом мы шли на гранитное ехать, а ты сказал, что ты у меня это... Ну да, такое состояние, как у Этот дёргает, глаз дергается левый. Левый глаз дергается, сказал, и ногу тянет. А потом, да. 2 января, пошел ну, на Это нарушение мозгового кровообращения, инсульт да. называется. Я Раньше был похож, был, 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 был Это штук 200, так выражаешь, знакомство имел, так, ну, по, по памяти так. Ну, мимолетные такие знакомства. А встретилась вот такая, сама Данила. Мы рады. Я рад, что она, ну, 14 лет, хорошая девочка. Это не каждый бы решился на это.
Четыре года мы прожили. Это гражданский подвиг называется. Вместе мы уже восемь лет. чуть-чуть, да. Ну, бендерка за грех, как мало, да, это вообще. Интер. Я не бендерка. Я рядом, недалеко от Киева, я центральная Украина. А, ну, центральная, это что, хлушка или как? Ну, западники на бендерке. Щира Украинка. Щира, ну я. А ты? Грек. Как Оксана Белозик, да, щира. Греко-татарин, ты смесь бульдога с носорогом. That's right. Uh, exclusion zone um, was arranged by decree of the government in 1986, uh, and it is most restrictful zone in the Ukraine, and, and still it is. So the entering uh, the exclusion zone is forbidden, just f free entering. Uh, in the at the moment, uh, the control, I would say, is at very good level, in general. Uh, regarding uh, shield, you mean... The uh, sarcophagus. Ah, shel shelter. shelter. Uh, they, they call uh, object shelter. Uh, actually, it is, it is called uh, the recently uh, uh, arch, what we... Uh, so bef uh, watch it uh, before the start of our um, um, program. It is uh, called the shelter, shelter the second, because uh, uh, the first shelter was built in extremely uh, concise uh, time uh, uh, period uh, in uh, 1986, without any design. But uh, it is most uh, successful countermeasure in the Chernobyl uh, accident uh, history. I also should um, would probably draw attention to another story. So while some people left Chernobyl and never returned, there are also those <coughs> who have just moved to outside the exclusion zone. Some of them moved from the Donbass region, heavily affected by Russia-Ukrainian war. One of them is uh, Valeria Kostyuk. She has been living in Zelena Poliana, just nine kilometers away from Chernobyl for around six months. And that's her story. This is Lara. She has three children. Sarhi, the oldest, is ten. Olya, the middle child, is seven. And the youngest, Sonia, is only two. For the last six months, the family have been living in the village of Zelena Polana, not far from the Chernobyl exclusion. Lara is from Snezhna, in the Donetsk region. The city is currently under separatist control. In 2014 to 2015, Snezhna was a hotspot in the armed conflict. The situation has not improved over the last two years. The family were forced to leave. We suffered and suffered and we had to because it was dangerous remaining into these conditions with small children, of course. You sit at home, there is these explosions like thunder. It frightens me as well, you know. When the baby was born, I had to fill some documents. I remember it was a tax office. I went, walked and walked, searched and searched. Nothing. I asked some passerby, by and he said, yes, there is a tax office. I looked over and it was a pile of bricks. That it was. Lara gathered her children, packed her things, locked her flat and traveled to Zelena Polana. She left her relatives and friends behind in Snezhna. We got through it, of course. Well, it was nothing really, mainly because the military situation had eased up. They looked at the baby. Who you are, little one? What's your name? They said, Sofika. They were joking. Even the people stood nearby supported us. This was an empty building, which the previous owners allowed Lara to live in. Her relatives in Snezhna sent her some of her things that she left behind. This is our little home. It was built by older sister. Yes, she called Ola, that's right. This is where she laid down some branches here at tree stumps. She put towels on them, but we took them off. We also took the shit off the grass because there is nothing we can do with them here. 
Zelena Poliana was not part of the exclusion zone. The locals say that a radioactive cloud settled above here. Although the people were not evacuated, many left on their own accord. Less than 300 people remained in the village. <laughs> From here, it's 9 kilometers to the Poliska checkpoint, where the exclusion zone starts, and 54 kilometers to Chernobyl itself. The nearest school and hospital are in the neighboring village. There are children travel there every day on the school bus. There used to be five displaced families from Donbass in Zelena Poliana. The local residents invited them to live in their homes. But the displaced people did not stay long, as there is no work in the village. Therefore, some have moved to Kiev, and others have returned to Donbass. The world is not without good people, and every time they prove with us again and again, and they better and better. With every problem we get here, more supporters and helpers. As soon as we get here, people came immediately with some potatoes, some cucumbers, tomatoes, mushrooms. One man came with grapes. I'm your neighbor, let's get to know each other. The children are given threats here and there. I wouldn't say it's a catastrophe for me. I'll try to keep going, although it's harder, of course. But what we can do, we'll put through, isn't it? Right, Sonia? Uh, but how you assess generally the level of the ecological awareness by the state and by the population? At some point I've, I sometimes would think that uh, with this history Ukrainians should really include all the things connected to environment, safety, uh, to ecology as something extremely important. But do you see that? And what are also your major concerns? Because from my point of view I understand that we accumulated a huge experience in mitigation of consequences, in understanding reasons, uh, in understanding impacts on the, the nature, on human. But on the other hand, we still don't have a certain level in uh, keeping and main maintaining safety and security, not only radiological, but ecological as well, in general. But we uh, are generally on the right way in order to be more ecological and uh, as a part of uh, uh, this opinion there is as I mentioned uh, the decision of the, our government to found the radioecological uh, preserve in the, at the territory of the exclusion zone. It is move in the right direction.
full version of our report Romatske had made for you uh, for the anniversary, as well as an interview, can be found on our webpage en.romatske.ua. As well, we encourage you to watch our investigation done past the new exclusion zone about the environmental threats mass flooding of the mines may bring to the region. You can find it on the section, the special project at our webpage. As well, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. We are there 24-7 for you. So thank you from the entire team of Romatske International. We are here to explain Ukraine and Eastern Europe for you. And with this, I tell you goodbye.